Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning for this week's Come Follow Me lesson with the Mormon News Report podcast. My name is Jenny Noonan Dye, and I am joining you from Provo, Utah, along with my husband, John Dye. He's the one who's responsible for everything that you see on your screen for those of you who are joining us via the live stream video. As always, for those who are participating in real time here on our video stream, we'd love to hear from you. Where you are, what stood out to you in your study this week, whether it's the first or the 50th time you've read these verses, or even if you didn't read them at all. We do try to get to as many comments as we can, just as we would, <laughs> just as we would if we were gathered together in person. We like to use, we like to try to use this space and time as a supplement to your other Come Follow Me studies to sometimes take a deeper dive into at least one aspect of the lesson that stands out. We love having your participation and your feedback. I'd like to excuse my co-host for the Mormon News Report podcast, Brent Malone. He's in Detroit. He's helping with some family responsibilities. And I'd like to welcome our complete Come Follow Me guru, is what I'm going to say, uh, all the way from California. It is Ben Bernards. Good morning, Ben. Hello and welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. We're so glad to be here on yet another Mormon News Report Hour of Power, the AP Church History version supplementing your Come Follow Me lesson. It's We're presenting kind of that, that extra end of year study session that your TA said you should really go to before the final. And you thought that it would have been smart to attend, but instead your buddy showed up with the new Mortal Kombat game. And so you went over to their house with a six pack of root beer and pretzels and spent till three in the morning, learning how to do the next fatality. And you wound up failing the test and lowering your GPA and missed out on your chance to get into your first choice school. But hey, that's okay, because community colleges are good too, right? That was quite specific. <laughs> morning, everybody, welcome to class. Glad to have you here. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, so happy to have everyone here. Thank you for that, Ben. Uh, today is Sunday, May 23rd, 2021. The lesson today is called A Faithful, A Just, and A Wise Steward, and it covers Doctrine and Covenants sections 51 through 57. I want to go ahead and say hello to Tony. Uh, he says, hello, welcome back. I've missed you for a couple of weeks. Hello from England. So he's in the UK. Uh, we appreciate Tony being here, the comments that he shares and his contributions, just as, as we do with everyone who, who takes a minute to kind of share with us their thoughts. Doctrine and Covenants sections 51 through 57. This is kind of more of a, this week's study is uh, more in volume, I will I would say, just compared to the last few lessons that we've had, which seem to be, not, and not that this is light in content, but sometimes when we go through, mm, should I say administrative mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, readings, there, there are more, you know, words, names, lists, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Mission calls, sure. Assignment, yeah. busy stuff. Yeah. yeah, and I mean that's that's kind of the tricky part about tricky part about scripture is that, <clears throat> and please, I hope this doesn't come out wrong, but not all scripture is scripture, if that makes sense. Yeah, like sometimes in the scriptures, there's just a lot of there's a lot of additional stuff that really has nothing to do with doctrine, and it's just like, okay, I am booting up this church for the first time, and there's a lot of stuff that's happening. You know, this this week's discussion is really kind of interesting because. Sometimes when we talk about church history things and in this this entire year that we've been doing Come Follow Me for uh, Doctrine and Covenants, we've approached it with a, a several specific mindsets. Like, you know, we want to get deeper on the doctrine, but we also want to present cognitive skills to add to our mental toolkit. So when we are dealing with the tricky issues of church history, paired with our modern day life, we can make better sense of it, right? It's learning how to be wise and learning how to do things better. So sometimes in our classes, we present like, hey, church history pro tip, you know, all that good stuff. Sometimes we present pitfalls, like we look at things that they did wrong, that they did not uh, do correctly or things that we can learn from it. And we're like, hey, let's, let's watch out for this pitfall. Mm -hmm. And today's class is really gonna have none of those. Today's class is gonna be very much looking at several specific verses and having a frank and honest and possibly uncomfortable discussion about money. How dare because, 
I know. I mean, we're just going right there. We're hitting that wallet book. So it sometimes it's it just feels weird. And sometimes my wife and I have just learned over the years that we've been married that man, money can just be so stupid sometimes. And it can cause us to be stupid sometimes. So hopefully we're gonna look at a couple of things today and figure out ways that we can be less stupid with it. Excellent. So lead off question for you, Jen and John and Tony, if you'd like to chime in as well. Um, has there ever been a time in your life when you've had to try to distinguish a want from a need? Oh man. Hmm. What do you think? How do you distinguish a want from a need? How to distinguish a want from a need? Well, I suppose we could turn to the hierarchy of <laughs> needs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What do you mean for those who for those who don't know? Well, this is kind of off the cuff, but it's a um, it's it's a it's often illustrated by a pyramid, which mm -hmm. you know at the bottom is more the the foundation. I'm just going to try to um, to uh, while John pulls this up, just kind of try to <laughs> sure stall a little bit. But but it it basically it goes through what as humans, we, we need, it's a, it's, it's a psychological kind of, it's, um, it's not uncommon to, to see this in all sorts of different aspects. In fact, I've seen it in a Relief Society lesson before, mm. but it, it goes through at the bottom of the pyramid, the basics, what we need, which is, I believe like water, shelter, something like that. Uh, yeah. Air, water, food, shelter, mm. sleep, clothing and reproduction those are uh, physiological needs and then mm. and then one that's the basic pyramid because if you don't have those we die exactly right. like like that's that's the basis of what you mm. need and then one step up from that we've got things that are still you know still some people would probably consider them vital but if you don't have that first layer then it doesn't really matter uh, the second, mm. you know, it's safety, it's personal security, it's employment, it's resources, it's property, it's, it's health. And, mm. um, and then, yeah, you know, as you go up, it's not that any of those things are not things that we, that we want or desire, but, you know, that the very top of the pyramid is self-actualization, which is something that we all, I think, I think in general is or should be. <laughs> A life in pursuit, self actualization. Sure. But unless we have those other things um, supporting us, then that's not something that that we we would be able to to achieve. So oh, when yeah. comes, oh, go ahead. Uh, I think that that's really awesome. Um, like being able to have the understanding that different needs have different priorities. There you go. Mm -hmm. That. You know that at, at the core of our humanity is that physiological need that exists whether or not we're aware of it right and then we need to be safe and then in the middle we've got this whole idea of love and belonging and and these are these are things that are surprisingly universal like you said to the human experience it's completely subconscious it's something that we don't have to decide or even agree upon but it's all it's all there um I, I think it's kind of funny how those things can have such an emotional, almost visceral reaction, right? When we see something that triggers a need. And, and to be clear, in the context of this, uh, this discussion, distinguishing the difference from a want and a need is, is hard to do, right? And especially I've attempted to try to teach it to my kids because sometimes I will experience spontaneous desire for things that I see and I insist that it's a need. Right. I'm walking with my wife through the store and I see the new Death Star Lego set with 3000 pieces and 12 custom minifigs. And I need it. Many things. I need It's like that is that is a physiological need. That is the bottom of my pyramid. Give me that Lego set. And the wife is like, no, sorry. Yeah. So I, I, I think, you know, when it comes down to it. It also has to do with something, right? When you are, according to your age and your experience, your maturity, because <laughs> kids. What are you saying? I'm saying that we all have 
had an experience with a child who thinks that they will actually die if they don't have their blankie or their squishy or whatever it is that they, you know, that they say that they require. But, but it's, it's a real, like you said, Ben, it's a real struggle. There are times in our lives when, you know, you look at the middle of the pyramid, love and belonging. And, you know, during a breakup, it can feel like your actual heart is breaking, you know, that, that you might actually perish without, um, without the companionship of someone or, or, you know, you know what I'm saying? So, um, I, I think that, that that initial response can, can definitely, (laughs) when you're at the store and you see your, your Death Star Lego set, that can be an indicator, but, but having either, having the perspective of either, you know, your partner or a friend there to give the perspective of "Mm, not really, or the perspective of time can help you distinguish between those things. Absolutely. Oh, so good. So some of the other topics that come up in today's lesson are a little bit about this, right? This whole idea of how do you deal with money and how did what happened with the saints back in the day? What lessons can we learn from it? And like we said at the top of the class, these dis- these discussions can be tricky because it's tricky situations that they went through and it's difficult topics because frankly, trying to live the gospel and trying to be a human being is not easy, you know? And we're gonna attempt to solve it in the one hour that we have here. So like last week, hey, guess what? We solved philosophy. We've discovered how to discover truth. Today, we're, we're solving poverty environmentalism. Perfect. Awesome. Perfect things for church. Now, for full, for the full historical overview of everything that happened from a historical perspective in these sections, John, if you wouldn't, if you'd pull up the next slide, please. Uh, there are two sections linked in the in the Come Follow Me that I highly, highly, highly recommend. These are in found in the Revelations in Context app. The first one is called A Bishop Unto the Church, which is all about. Uh, Edward Partridge and his role as a bishop, his background, where he came from, who is the guy? Why is he a bishop? What is a bishop nowadays? And why is that different than what we now consider a bishop? And the second one, uh, very poignant, is the journey of the Colesville branch, which is like a, a cluster of families that was geographically far away from the core of the saints, but some of the people there, specifically the Knight family, were very close friends of Joseph Smith and his family. And they became anchors to the saints in many different cities, all the way from New York to Kirtland to Missouri, and some of them even all the way to the West. However, when that branch of the folks at Colesville tried to join up with Kirtland, we had problems. And that friction is what we see illustrated in today's class. So... A very short summary of what happens when they get to Kirtland is the saints are gathering and people that have money and people that have property were being asked slash commanded to share it with those who didn't have any. And kind of like putting a a grape in a wine press, when we're put under pressure, it will tend to reveal what is inside. There's something about being put in that pressure that lets out our real true selves. And it's easy for us to say, oh, Lord, I believe when we are asked to say things like come to church on Sunday and then go home. And that's about it. But when they were asked to give up their property that they've worked their entire life to have, when they've asked to give over their money, you know, a 500 acre farm to a church that you've been a member of for a week or two and you hardly even know the guy or to let immigrant migrant families move onto your farm or buy your property at a huge discounted rate. For some of the saints, that was a cost too high. So what can we learn from this? Let's take a look at some of the verses and see what we see, all right? Uh, We're gonna dive right in to Doctrine and Covenants section 51, verse three. Jenny, could you read that for me, please? You bet. Section 53. Wherefore, let my servant Edward Partridge and those whom he has chosen, in whom I am well pleased, appoint unto this people their portions, every man equal according to his family, according to his circumstances, and his wants and needs. Hmm. Okay, so lots of stuff to unpack here. It's interesting how this verse starts off with a seemingly egalitarian uh, 
doctrinal angle. Like every man is equal. Like we're all going to get the same thing. But then it immediately veers off into four qualifiers according to their family, according to their circumstances, according to their wants. What? Oh. And according to their needs. So question, is there room for wants versus needs in the financial affairs of the church? Should that make any sense? Hmm. In the financial affairs of the church, is there room for it? Go ahead. Did you have something? Oh, well, I was just touching you to touch Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I thought you were emotional to me. Yeah. I, you know, one key thing here that I was thinking about, the Lord wants us to be happy, right? If you hmm. only have the baseline, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, psychological safety, you know, some of those basic things that that's not living. I don't think that's our definition, mm. nor do I think it's he our heavenly father, what he wants for us. So for sure, we need to have some wants in there. You need that death star or millennium Falcon Lego set, right? You need to have fun. The heavenly father wants you to have fun. So basically I believe that there is room for that. And to be a just and a wise steward, you have to be able to not only have what you need, but also I believe what you want, right? There has to be, some people will do more with less than, um, than others. And, and, and that's fine. I mean, basically if I had a 50 acre farm and you had a five acre farm or vice versa, you know, you, that, that doesn't mean that I'm more equipped or better equipped to take care of my land than yours. Um, and, and I, and I think that's key. It's like the strengths of every person involved in the law of consecration helps augment what others bring to the party. And that for me is, is quite nice because as we know in this life, um, not everyone is given according to their, to their talents. Right. I, I think that, uh, that sometimes that is one thing that's overlooked. So wants and needs are required here. So, so good. Yeah, thank you. I, I like that a lot. I think that this is actually quite timely and I know that we could actually spend the entire hour on this, but just about a year ago is when, at least in this country, in the United States, we had, we had um, quite a public and more inclusive than at least in a lot of years um, discussion ongoing about, about equality, about equity. Um, I want to talk for just a second about this verse that you just had me read, Ben, Doctrine and Covenants, section 51, verse 3. It has always struck me when I read this verse, and it has several times actually this week, this past week in, in my study, the, the listing of this at the end of the verse, every man equal according to his family, according to his circumstances, and his wants and needs. And I guess... I don't know if literarily is a word, um, is you know the <laughs> the adverb of that wants and needs probably sounds better than needs and wants, but why it would be according to your family, according to your circumstance, and then wants would be listed before needs. I don't know if that is circumstantial or if that is intentional in this verse, but that has stuck out to me. I don't did that is that something that you noticed as well, or am I just being mm -hmm. a nerd? No, I, I, I think you're right on point. There is something to be learned about recognizing that wants can be valid. And like John was saying, it's okay to want to have nice things. Mm -hmm. Sometimes my want means I want a PlayStation mm -hmm. or somebody says, hey, I'm going to come to the church and hey, I'm, I'm joining my property in the church. Awesome. So I want one of those houses in Tuscany that's selling for, you know, a penny. Can you give me one of those? <laughs> now, I, I don't think that it's wrong to want things. And I think this is this is something that, that Christianity and other religions have struggled with for millennia, which is the idea that maybe being pious and godly means living an ascetic hermitage life where we deprive ourselves of absolutely everything and we don't thrive, but we merely survive, right? We, we yeah. strip away absolutely everything and we live in a cave and we cut ourselves off from everything and we have a beating heart and we have the absolute bottom of that foundation but we really don't have anything else so perhaps one of the core messages that we're learning with this is that yeah it's okay to want things and that is a double-edged sword so perhaps 
the point of life is learning how to balance the want, right? I mean, and yes. hashtag that's life. Hashtag what? That's life. That's what we do. Yeah. And I, I think I just, I want to make sure that I'm clear in this, in, in acknowledging this as well, that when we're talking about wants and needs, that there is, and I know this can be a trigger word for people, so just buckle up and hear me out, please, um, that there is an element of privilege to our wants. And let me explain what I, what I mean by that. You know, Ben, you mentioned that, you know, you're at the store and you see the the Death Star Lego set or you see a PlayStation and that is a want. And like John mentioned, and it's absolutely true, you know, men are that they might have joy. We are here to enjoy life. There are people who are spending their entire lives time wise to provide the absolute essentials according to their families, according to their circumstances and according to their needs and their want is a nap. And, and while they maybe would love to have a PlayStation or a vacation, it isn't even like that is so far down the road because of their circumstance that we need to be aware of people who are in different places on their paths in life and I think this this absolutely applies to what we're studying this week, uh, because it is really easy for us to slip into some pretty unrighteous judgment when it comes to looking at others and what their needs and their wants ought to be. Hmm. That is an absolutely critical point. I'm so glad that you brought that up. And, and like you said, yeah, this this can be triggering. This is uncomfortable stuff. And frankly, that's part of why we have religion is to help us grow through the discomfort, right? Because if if it doesn't challenge us to become better people, then what good is it? Yeah. And what good are we? So I, I think one thing that's helpful for us to be clear about is that you've talked about equality. And you mentioned in there a word of equity. Mm -hmm. which I think is really interesting that there's a difference between the two. And it took me a while to understand the difference as well. If you were to go out, you know, ask a man on the street and say, hey, could you, did, what's the difference between equality versus equity? They probably wouldn't be able to clarify. I know that I couldn't. And it wasn't until I found some illustrations that helped me. Of course, I'm a very visual person. Basically, it, it looks something like this. Equality is the idea that you give the same quantity to every single person. Mm -hmm. So if I had four different people and each of those people wanted a bike, I would give for equality's sake, the same bike to all four people. Because now that is 100% equal, right? Every bike is identical. Nobody has anything better. Nobody has anything worse. Everybody has the same bike. And so if my focus was trying to give an equal portion to people, like I'm cutting a cake into four equal slices and my boy says, wait a minute, yours is a little bit bigger than others. And like, no, no, no. If I'm trying to be equal to everybody, then I'd give the exact same thing to everybody. Now, from an objective perspective, that works. That gets the job done. However, from a subjective perspective, when you look at who you are giving to, when you look at what their needs and their capabilities are, Maybe not everybody needs the same bike. Maybe one of those people is in a wheelchair and they can't ride a traditional bike. Maybe one of those people is extra tall and has got heck of long legs mm -hmm. and that bike doesn't fit them. Maybe you've got a woman that can fit that bike just right the first time and you totally nailed it. Or maybe one of the four people is a little kid and they need a kid size bike mm -hmm. or training or whatever. So equity is the idea of, yes, we're going to give you a bike, but we're going to give you what you need. Mm. And if that means a recumbent bike <clears throat> for the person in the wheelchair, and if that means that that recumbent bike costs three times as much as the standard traditional bike, so be it, because mm. that's what you need. For the person with extra long legs, if I have to modify it, take it down to the bike shop, so be it. That's what you need. For the one person that we nailed it right the first time and they've got the absolute perfect bike for their needs, cool. That's totally awesome. And for the little kid who doesn't need the nice grown up bike, and if I'm going to spend a little bit less to give them a kid's bike, awesome. So be it. That's what they need. So it seems here that equity 
is where you look at the actual needs of the person first and then you back into it and figure out what their solution is. Mm -hmm. Or yeah, like Tony says, it's not about giving everybody an equal size piece of cake. It's giving a kid size piece of cake because they can't really eat that full piece that you gave them. That's exactly <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. And Tony shares a really interesting thing um, about, you know, when we were talking about the differences between needs and wants, he says, many times I need a transport and once I needed it for work, I was offered a car that worked, but looked ugly. I saw a car I couldn't afford, but it looked really good. Oh, I wanted it. I got it and it broke down. And he says, mm -hmm. um, it's not wrong to want things, but when it overrides your needs, as it did when with my case, in my case with the the car, it yeah, uh, you know, you can get burned. So, so that's that's a really good way to to look at it from our own perspective. But um, and and hello to Nancy in West Jordan joining us, of course, this morning. I really love this illustration that you've pulled up, Ben, because I think and I like how you describe it. It seems like with equity, it's more about. Um, looking at the individual and so that each individual can have like, like the, how do I say this? The result is more equal because of the experience they can have um, as, Bingo. as opposed to what they're given being equal because not everybody needs the same things. So is it possible that a person looking at this scenario, looking at the equity of everybody getting different types of bikes, is it possible that a person with a regular bike would sit there and go, hey man, that's not fair. That recumbent bike you gave to the person in the wheelchair, that costs like five times as much as mine. That That's not fair. Do you think that they might have that attitude sometimes? Uh, well, yeah, if, if what they're look if when they're describing fair is the amount of money or the amount of resources put into, you know, trying to get that person their need or their want, then yeah. But if what they're looking at is what is it that we want this person to, you know, to receive, if you give someone in a wheelchair, a bike that isn't recumbent, then it's a waste of money. It's a waste of resources yeah. because it's not going to be used. Absolutely. Absolutely. So trying to figure out this whole idea of how do we use money and how do we use resources for people, I, I think this is an absolute core principle that we need to be aware of, especially when we look at, uh, at how it affects our religious life and how we deal with people around us on a regular basis, that outcome-driven focuses, where if the goal is get everybody on a bike that suits their needs, mm. if that's the outcome, then we should be willing to do whatever it takes to get there, right? Sometimes you're gonna spend more, sometimes you're gonna spend less, that's gonna work. Now, the next topic that we're gonna to pivot to here briefly is related to this, because this idea is how do you use up the limited resources that you have? And when the saints got to the, when they got to Kirtland, they struggled with this because some people had bigger families and they needed a big farm. Some people had smaller families and so they needed a smaller farm. And it could feel like, wait, they got more than I did. How come, you know, how come they got five cows and I was only given one? Or, you know, one of, one of the new brethren that had just joined from the Shaker community, he's got this heck of a huge farm. And if you're taking a look at needs versus wants, maybe he didn't need the whole thing, right? Of course, he can be like, no, give me, give me, that's mine. So all that being said, once they arrived there, there was an interesting verse that stood out to them that they were commanded on how they were supposed to treat the property. Mm -hmm. And it has an effect of shifting their perspective on timeline. So let's take a look at this now. We're going we're gonna to change gears a little bit. Uh, section 51, verses 16 and 17. Jenny, would you please? Of course. And I consecrate unto them this land for a little season until I, the Lord, shall provide for them otherwise and command them to go hence. And the hour and the day is not given unto them. Wherefore, let them act upon this land as for years, and this shall turn unto them for their good. Ooh, okay, that key phrase, act upon this land as if for years. What does that mean? To me, it means, I mean, they were told, I don't remember if it was before this or after this, but that Ohio would be a temporary stop for them. Mm -hmm. They're not gonna spend mm -hmm. the rest of their lives here. But to me, what this is saying is, uh, it's the difference between 
investing, like really treating it as if this is going to be yours for the long term and you treat it well, as opposed to, oh, this isn't really mine. I'm just going to stop here and, you know, I'll just do what I need to do and kind of, you know, not mm. invest fully. That to me, that's what it, it seems. It, so investing fully. So this is interesting. Um, let's talk for a minute about putting down roots and investing. Mm -hmm. uh, how does how does that help us like mentally? Why is stability important? If, if you've, and let me qualify this by saying, if you've ever known or dealt with uh, people in military backgrounds that have yes. moved around a lot, yep. or adoption, foster homes, yep. multiple parents, yep. anything like that, why is stability so important? So <clears throat> stability, routine, uh, security, I think all of these things are related. I am not someone who grew up in a with a military background, but I think we all, if we aren't, then we know people who are, uh, yeah. who have been and they, they don't really, they don't really know, you know, if you ask where they're from, they say, oh, well, I, you know, lived in, Georgia and New York and Kansas and Germany, and they have all these places that they've lived. And then it's like, okay, well, which one did you like the best? Oh, well, I liked El Paso the best. That That's the one I consider my home or whatever it is. Um, I, I, when you said that, I was actually kind of thinking about how, you know, I've shared before that John and I moved to where we live right now last year. Yes, we moved during a pandemic. Thank you, please applause. Uh, and, and the deal is we moved to, to a new city, uh, a new neighborhood, new ward, of course. Um, and the reality is that the space that we have, it's kind of been our plan that we only need it for a certain number of years. We've got teenagers that are still at home. The rest of our kids are adults. And it's kind of like, if we're looking long-term at the plan, we will be able to downsize in the near future. Now, what good is it gonna do for us to when we meet people here in our neighborhood, in our ward, in our community, to say, well, I don't really need to get to know you because uh, we're, we're out of here in X number of years, right? Um, that's, to me, that's no way to live. You know, you, you mentioned something that that to me even has a higher sense of urgency, things like foster care. Um, people need security to thrive. Thank you, John, for anticipating what I was going to say. Um, that, you know, down in the physiological needs, shelter is one. But then, you know, when you have safety right there, personal security um, and resources, Though when those things change, that is essentially an upheaval. And when that happens to children, there can be long-term effects. And so when it comes to investing fully, when you think about it in that way, in a more serious way than the you know, personal experience I just shared with John and me in our new neighborhood, when you think about it, like you mentioned, Ben, with, with children in foster care, um, they need to know that they will be taken care of. And they need to not have worry of the future, but rather we talk a lot of, we've, or we've mentioned before, I guess, mindfulness, being present, living in the present and how that, that can help us thrive. So I hope that was clear enough. Absolutely, that was so great. You know, we talked about treating things differently if we're going to be there temporarily, right? <clears throat> I've lived in student wards uh, for years when my wife and I were in undergraduate school and at grad school and student wards can be so rough because every semester you've got hundreds of kids moving out and hundreds of kids moving in. I mean, we always had, uh, they actually had a moving coordinator. It was an official quote, lower C, lowercase C calling where you're just keeping track of who's moving in and out. Wow. And as a result, there were emotional connections and friendship bonds that people simply did not bother making because they were going to leave. Like, yeah, why bother putting down roots? Why, right? Why bother putting all that e emotional investment into somebody only to turn around and bail a few weeks later? 
um, that, that can be really hard. And if you know that you're going to be there for a long time, we treat things a little bit differently, right? So next question kind of related to this, to thinking about long term, not only us emotionally, but uh, the place that we're going to live in. These saints, when they moved to Kirtland, they were said, let's treat I want you to act as if you're going to be here for years. So that means planting trees under whose shade they did not know if they would rest, right? Raising crops that they themselves may not eat. So I guess here's the, the broader perspective question. How do we treat things differently if we want them to last? Ooh. And consider for, you know, a visual example, being handed a paper plate versus somebody's fine china. Sure. Sure. So okay. whether whether the things are relationships or the community in which we live or the property that we've been given or the things that we buy, do we treat it differently if we want it to last? And and if so, how? Yeah, and I you know, I'm I'm really glad that you that this is the image that you provided, the the difference between fine china and a disposable plate, because as you were talking about your experience with um did you say someone's well, if not calling, then assignment is the move in, move out coordinator. I just think about that from the perspective of, of youth and how important it is for youth to feel belonging and how difficult that would be if they feel the, the word that I thought of was disposable. You know, if, if people, if their leaders don't make, and again, this is related to what you, your excellent example about foster care, if a child, or, or an adult though, enters a situation and they are treated as if, well, you're not gonna be here very long, so I'm not gonna invest that much into you. That has mm -hmm. ramifications and they're not great. Absolutely. You know, I, I think the, the relationship aspect is one thing and the same can be said about the, the environment in which they grow in and the very environment that they're living there, right? I have mm -hmm. known people that have said, good faithful Latter-day Saints, that have said they really don't see the point in uh, environmentalism, like taking, like recycling or being concerned about greenhouse gases, because Jesus is going to come in a few years anyway, and he's going to burn the whole earth and second coming is going to take care of it. So I don't need to worry about it. Right. It's this whole idea that if you treat the world around you as something disposable, as something that's replaceable, then that means it's eventually going to run out. And so then that means that your worldview says that your goal is just consumption. Your priority is yourself, that the measurable trait of anything is whether or not it's useful to you, your personal utility. But a different worldview that I think that God is trying to help us perspective is to treat something as if it was irreplaceable. Something the goal is not consumption. The goal is preservation. Yeah. Priority is not me. The priority is us. And the measurable trait is whether or not something is sustainable, right? And this goes right into the, the next verse, which is kind of the key verse for the whole uh, section. This is DNC 51 verse 19. Uh, Jenny, would you mind writing, reading that for me, please? My pleasure. And whoso is found a faithful, a just, and a wise steward shall enter into the joy of his Lord and shall inherit eternal life. Oh boy. Okay. There is a ton to unpack here. No pressure. We've got four different verses and uh, four different words in here that we're going we're gonna to dive into. And nerd alert, we're going to get our Lord of the Rings on. Okay. So first question, we're going to start at the very end of the verse uh, with the question. The word starts with an S. Steward. Question for you, Jenny. Mm -hmm. Or John, if you want to try to explain. What is a steward? What defines a steward? I think of a steward as somebody who has a responsibility to take care of a thing. I, responsibility to take care of a thing. Yes, I, I would agree with that. Yeah, you're given something. And again, to your earlier example, it's not, uh, it's not the same as everyone else's, but hopefully it's something that causes you to stretch yourself, but it's, it's appropriate for your ability to care for it. Mm, good job. John, you want to go ahead and pull up the next one for me real quick? Um, you know, I, I'm totally in alignment to you there. And, and when I say we're getting into Lord of the Rings, I, I think this is a brilliant piece of literary history that is honestly the perfect parable for all of this. In the book, The Lord of the Rings, 
there is a kingdom. It's called the king. It was named the kingdom of Gondor. And thousands of years ago, an ancient terrifying threat came to the kingdom. And the king at the time was a righteous man that decided to go out in the front of his army to fight the evil. And he realized that he needed to leave somebody behind in the kingdom to take care of the affairs while he was gone. So he went to the personal steward of his home, like his right-hand man, his valet, right? And he went to the steward and he says, I'm hereby leaving you as the steward of the kingdom of Gondor while I'm gone. So you don't get to sit on the throne, but you're basically going to take my place. Watch this until I get back. And then he left. So spoiler alert, the king didn't come back until his descendant much later went walking through a tunnel, got a sword, met up with an elven girlfriend and some four little halflings and finally came back and says, OK, now I'm going to take the place of the king. But, you know, that's just that's just a couple thousand pages of, of old British literature and an awesome movie with a totally smashing soundtrack. But the point is, is that the steward kind of in the book kind of got stuck up on his job. He thought that he was really, really good. And I think you guys described that the whole idea of a steward is somebody that's supposed to take care of something. John, if you would go ahead and pull up the next one. I think there's some very instructive key lessons here about what a steward should be. The steward is not the king. So four things specifically. Number one, the steward is allowed temporary jurisdiction over a portion of the kingdom. It, their jurisdiction had a beginning and it's going to have an end and it's not over the entire kingdom, but just a portion of it. Number two, they are granted free autonomy to make decisions without requiring pre-authorization or as we call it, free agency. Number three, they exercised their authority equivalent to the sovereign they represented. In other words, they're just as good as the king. Like they didn't have to think of themselves lower than or not quite as good as just because they weren't the king, they were standing quite literally in their place. One might say they took the name of the king upon them. And number four, upon the king's return, they relinquished their stewardship and gave a reckoning of the disposition of their property. In other words, they returned and they reported. They had to say, here's what I did and here's how things went. So that's kind of an outline or an idea of what a, a steward is or what they were. Jenny, any of these things stand out to you? Any thoughts on, on this and how it applies to us to be a wise, just, and good steward? Sure. Um, I, I think a lot about, I mean, this, what, what a great example. And you know that I'm not, like Lord of the Rings is not my jam, but, um, <laughs> but I really like how you laid this out. It, it actually reminds me of something interesting um, and I hope this isn't too much of a left turn. There is a podcast that I really enjoy and the host uh, is a celebrity and uh, he is, he's known for, well, not, he's not known for, but one of his things is that he's, he, he is, he does not consider himself a man of faith um, of, you know, he doesn't really subscribe to any sort of religion and, and another celebrity who he was interviewing in a recent interview, who's also an actor, the person being interviewed he he has an aunt and uncle who their names are Mary Evelyn Tucker and John Allen Grimm. And they actually have this legacy themselves that they are the co-founders and directors of the Forum on Religion and Ecology at Yale University. Um, and, and his aunt teaches in the joint master's program in religion and ecology at Yale between the School of Forestry and environmental studies and the divinity school. So you've got Yale, which is a very prestigious university and someone who is teaching with, you know, the divinity school and forestry and environmental studies. And to the host of this podcast, he found that fascinating, uh, you know, and, and the person he was interviewing said, well, yeah, because people who profess to be Christians, who profess to believe in Jesus Christ, who profess to, to think that God created this earth for them should take care of the earth. And it was kind of like an aha moment in real time on this podcast as the host was like, oh my gosh, that totally makes sense. Because again, this person is does not subscribe to Christianity, but said it would make sense that as a Christian, you think, well, God created this for me. I should take care of it. 
Why isn't that more of a prevalent um, of a, of a prevalent uh, attitude? And to me, that ties right into the stewardship that you're talking about. That you know, because especially in this context in, with the Saints in Ohio, a lot of it had to do with land. When, when God said to Adam and Eve in, in our own creation mythology, looking at the garden and by extension, the lone and jewelry world outside the garden, um, when he says, I'm giving you this garden, now go to and tend it and dress it and quote, take good care of it. Mm -hmm. I think that is just as much a commandment as love one another. Yep. And how can we possibly love one another if we can't even begin to love the earth that we are standing on? Yep. Right. So when we are expected to be a steward, man, there's a there's a lot that we are responsible for. And granted, that can feel overwhelming and that can feel frustrating when we have systems around us that don't seem to be working. But that's part of the struggle that we're here for. Right. There, there's a couple other words in this verse, John, if you wouldn't mind pulling up the next one, some other qualifying adjectives that are in that scripture of what kind of a steward we're supposed to be. And boy, we could spend an entire hour, but I'm just going to call out a couple of things. It says, whoso has found a faithful, just and wise steward. And so, you know, the word nerd part of me loves finding really juicy definitions. And I love the idea of faithful in the terms of, say, like a lover. Like a person who is faithful to the one they love, they are the person that they will remain loyal and true and steadfast. You know, my girl's going to be faithful while I'm gone off to war kind of an idea. Yeah. They, they're the person. And that's what faithful means. It's different than having faith, even though they are related. But it means that you stay true to it and you stay steadfast even when the person that you claim to love is not there justice in this idea, we, we've talked a little bit about this whole idea of, of equity versus equality, but a just person is somebody who is morally right. And part of the challenge of that adjective is it is completely subjective, right? It is completely dependent on one's personally calibrated internal moral compass, which means if that moral compass is calibrated to a different pole position, then that person's sense of morality will be out of line or skewed from another's perspective. And so what they think is just is not necessarily universal. So in this case, what we have to do is make sure that we're calibrated towards uh, a, a divinely approved sense of truth. And finally, he says, not just be a smart steward, but to be a wise steward. Somebody once said, wisdom comes from good judgment Good judgment comes from experience and experience comes from bad judgment. Mm. <laughs> and then the only way that you can get to wisdom is by making bad choices first and getting experience from it and learning good judgment from that. And that's when you become wise. So the really wise people are able to learn from others mistakes. But if we have to learn from our own mistakes, well, you know what? That's OK, too. However we get there, however we attain wisdom is, is perfectly fine. And I think this quote from President Kimball that was actually featured in the Come Follow Me manual in the lesson perfectly sums this up from a Latter-day Saint perspective. Uh, he says, this comes from uh, an article in the Ensign in, in 1977. He says, quote, in the church, a stewardship is a sacred spiritual or temporal trust for which there is accountability. Because all things belong to the Lord, we are stewards over our bodies, our minds, families, and properties. A faithful steward is one who exercises righteous dominion, cares for his own, and looks to the poor and the needy. Oh, man, that is that is so good. Any thoughts on this, Jen or John? Uh, not from me. Do you have any? Yeah, well, I, I would just say, and I don't know if you were going to go down this direction, but the parable of the, of the talents in Matthew 25, you know, one one receives eight, one receives two, one receives one, and the person who receives one goes and buries it. You know, I, I think that goes into what we hear President Kimball saying, right? We, we have, there are so many facets of things that we have stewardship over, whether it's our families, ourselves, you know, our jobs, whatever responsibilities, our church callings, etc. 
And he expects us to magnify whatever we're involved in and to make it become better, right? Whatever that is, the earth, we're talking about that today. So caring for others and be, becoming better ourselves is, is key and critical here. Absolutely. <clears throat> and in fact, that ties really well into the next verse that we want to highlight here, which is DNC section 52, verse 40. We're going to skip ahead into the next section. Jenny, would you, uh, can I ask you to read that, please? Of course. And remember in all things, the poor and the needy, the sick and the afflicted. For he that doeth not these things, the same is not my disciple. Holy cow. Okay, this is big, right? When he's saying, remember, in all things, the poor, the needy, the sick, and the afflicted, and if you don't do this, you're not mine. You know, when we talk as Latter-day Saints about how we are identified as a people, there are a lot of external factors that seem almost stereotypical tropes. Hmm. How many talks have we had about, we're Latter-day Saints because of the word of wisdom? where we are known for magic underwear, or we are known for CTR rings, or we are known for the choir at Temple Square, or we are known because dating is 16, right? You can look at so many of these things that are very valid and legitimate hallmarks of our faith. But imagine, just imagine a world, if the hallmark of Mormonism or Latter-day Saint or Christianity, imagine if us Latter-day Saints we were known for those people that were willing above all to take care of those in poverty or need or sick or afflicted. If that was the thing that people talked about, if they didn't talk about the lack of caffeine, if they didn't talk about the coffee or the alcohol or the tobacco or the polygamy or any of those other things, what if they saw Latter-day Saints and the first thing they thought about was, man, those are the people that are like always willing to spend money and get programs together to help poor people or to help those in need and not even at a macro level but even at a micro level like oh yeah that latter-day saint guy that i knew he was the first one in line to do what it took to keep people from getting sick and again content warning this could make some people feel uncomfortable imagine if the latter-day saints considered it not just a nice to have but a religious duty to prevent yourself from getting sick in what other fashion necessary and to keep others from getting sick. And when I say a religious duty, imagine if your temple recommend were put on the line for it because that were to jive with this verse that says, you are supposed to look out for the poor and the sick and the afflicted. And if you don't do it, you're not my disciples. Who? what? Would that be a little bit different of a world than we're in right now, Jen? A little bit, a little bit. Just a tiny bit. And I think that these things are kind of related to the very next verse that we'll talk about here. Uh, we're going to skip ahead a couple of sections in DNC 56. Uh, we're going to go to DNC 56, 16 and 17. And this is kind of wrapping up this entire discussion. Hopefully we'll put a nice bow on it. Could you read 15 and 17 for us, please? Yes. Woe unto you, rich men, that will not give your substance to the poor, for your riches will canker your souls, and this shall be your lamentation in the day of visitation, and of judgment, and of indignation. The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and my soul is not saved. Woe unto you, poor men, whose hearts are not broken, whose spirits are not contrite, and whose bellies are not satisfied and whose hands are not stayed from laying hold upon other men's goods, whose eyes are full of greediness, and who will not labor with your own hands. You know, I what I appreciate about these two verses is the equality in which the potential uh, condemnation falls on both those that have and those that have not because it recognizes the natural human tendency to be able to be prideful and selfish regardless of the contents of your bank account. It's possible to be prideful in our poverty, looking up and being unwilling to help ourselves to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. It's also very quite possible and quite prevalent to be in a position of looking down and saying, well, if that person is not going to help themselves, then I'm not going to help them either. 
right? It's this, this, this instinctive reaction to hold on to our things and to, to clutch it towards ourselves. And again, this, is, this can be sensitive and uncomfortable things to talk about for some of us. And it might trigger a defensive reaction, like where we point the fingers at other people and we say, no, 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 they're the ones at fault, it's not me. I think it was uh, Truman Madsen who said, uh, the most sensitive part of a man's anatomy is his pocketbook. And that is certainly uh, a case that we see here, especially when it's pointed out in this verse, it says that these riches would canker your soul. Mm-hmm. Jen, have you ever had a canker sore like on your tongue or, or, your, or on your lips or something like that? On my tongue, yeah, yeah. Oh, isn't that the worst? Yes. And I think this is really great. It's, it's a beautiful illustration. Because if it cankers your soul, what a canker means is something that is, it's tender when you touch it. Like if you even get close to it, it's going to hurt, right? And like what we're seeing here, when you have a discussion about money, it's tender. People don't like to talk about it. And when you have a canker sore, like you can't enjoy anything because it, because it is so, it takes over everything. You can't enjoy anything because it takes over everything. It's, it's your focus. Like that becomes your focus. And it grows because there's this, because from a physiological perspective, there's an infection inside, right? And it will continue to grow and it will continue to rot unless it is met with some sort of an antidote. I, I think this is a, a beautiful choice of words in this, in this verse because it reveals that riches have the capability to introduce, uh, again, Lord of the Rings, like the dragon sickness on the dwarvish wealth of Erebor, right? That's what Smog the Great and Magnificent had, and that's what uh, Thor and Oakenshield was subject to and all the rest of the dwarves. In other words, there is a soul-sickening disease that comes when we try to hoard money for ourselves. And one of the hallmarks of it is this idea that I'm not hoarding it, it's mine. I deserve it, it came to me, it is precious, it belongs to me, and nobody can tell me otherwise. Um, If I may, I wanna address a comment that we have in the comment section. Ken says, how about those people on the street begging for help that do this for a living and are able to get a job but prefer to beg? Are they considered the poor and the needy? Ken? That's an excellent question. And it's one that I've asked myself over the years. And the answer that I've come to for myself is, I don't know if that's their preference. I don't know if they're able to get a job. I don't know if they're, if they, you know, if if you know that someone is, is begging because that's their career choice, I guess that's one way to consider it. But I also feel like that's some, something that um, is really easy to say to ourselves to make ourselves feel better about not giving. Um, when I've when I've seen people beg and I've had the means to do so, I give. And I don't weigh myself down with wondering if they are being honest. Because if they're asking my choice to give or not, according to my means and ability to do so, does not have to do with their choice to beg, but my choice to respond to the asking. Excellent point. You know, I had a a seminary teacher one time talking about this uh, with a seminary class. He was was talking about the the panhandlers that were frequently seen outside Temple Square before uh, the anti-panhandling ordinances were enacted. Right. And he was trying to walk us through as seminary students um, this same idea. Is it moral? Is it ethical? Are we supposed to help them? Do we do it? What if you know that that person is there intentionally trying to prey upon the charitable feelings of folks coming out of temple sessions and that's that's their gig, right? Should we still do it? Yes or no? And And the point that he was trying to make is what that person does with the money is on them. What I do with the money is on me. Yep. And God is not asking me to care about what that person does. God is not asking me to care about whether they use it for food or for shelter or for drugs or booze. That's, that's not my business. What is my business is the fact that I have something in my hand that could help another person. 
potentially. And God is asking me to let it go. And he's not going to force me. But like the verses here said, if you want to be my disciple, you have to learn how to let it go. And you have to learn how to give it to, to the other people. And when we feel that instinctive response to make an excuse as to why I shouldn't or to justify not doing so, that is the very cankering that God is warning us against. So just like every other type of resource that can canker our souls, well, like every other choice that we make, the reality is we have finite resources, right? And so every choice that we make is a compromise. And if we don't kill the rot or the fungus or the virus, then things will get worse. One, one way that that cankering can become manifest, and we're going to kind of wrap this up here, is, is how we choose to spend it, right? If we have limited resources to give, then this means that every dollar that we spend shows our priorities. They become the trade-offs. We can't spend everything on everyone. So where do we choose to prioritize? And, and that is the great... Uh, that's the great challenge that we have with figuring out our money. And I want to close today with a, a quote, um, non-LDS source, but still very instructive. This is Dwight D. Eisenhower, former president of the United States. Context of this was a speech that he was giving to the American Society of Newspaper Editors in Washington, D.C. on April 16th, 1953. Now, this was at the time when the Korean War was winding down. And the threat of a Cold War with Russia was starting to wind up. And people in the government and outside were trying to decide what was an appropriate amount of spending on military equipment just to point guns over the ocean. And his response was wonderfully instructive. Here's what he said. And as you listen to this, I hope that you would bear in mind this idea of our responsibility to take, for, take care of those in need. And how do we choose how to spend resources? All right, here's what he said. Quote, every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired signifies in the final sense, a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and are not clothed. This world in arms is not spending money alone. It is spending the sweat of its laborers, the genius of its scientists, the hopes of its children, the cost of one modern heavy bomber is this, a modern brick school in more than 30 cities. It is two electric power plants, each serving a town of 60,000 population. It is two fine, fully equipped hospitals. It is some 50 miles of concrete pavement that we pay for a single fighter with a half million bushels of wheat. We pay for a single destroyer with new homes that could have housed more than 8,000 people. This is not a way of life at all. In any true sense, under the cloud of threatening war, it is humanity hanging from a cross of iron. So, to be clear, I am not saying, this is, you know, Ben speaking again, I am not saying that we should abolish military spending. This, and obviously this is not a true apples to apples comparison, right? This is kind of apples to oranges because the goods are not necessarily fungible, but the principle I think here is that if we want to have a long lasting Zion society, something that sustains the life and the liberty of all of its citizens, where the resources are spent on the people who really need them, and we have programs that give life and health and education and autonomy and safety, you know, that is ultimately what Zion's gonna look like if we can get there. And we have to over try to overcome these tendencies that we have to hoard it all for ourselves. During this pandemic, we've seen a variety of responses of people dealing with lockdowns. I don't know about you, Jen, but sometimes I felt kind of annoyed at the celebrities that were lamenting being locked in their huge mansions, totally bored, while we saw essential workers, we saw women, we saw people of color going back to work and bearing the brunt of this lockdown. And it became apparent that while all of us were in the same storm, not all of us were in the same boat, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And I think that when we have these emotional responses to confronting wealth inequality, if we feel guilty or defensive or dismissive of the problem, perhaps that is our chance to improve. Perhaps that's the light of Christ that is asking us inside whether we are truly willing to be our brother's keeper or our sister's keeper. 
And it's true that we can't fix everything. We can't help everybody. But maybe at the very least, could we start by agreeing to look at the problem? Because being fair to everyone doesn't mean being equal to everyone. We're all born in different circumstances and through whatever cosmic roll of the dice we have, the inequalities that we face are uncontrollable and they will likely always exist. So sometimes the most fair and just remedy if born on religious principles means giving only a little bit to those in a privileged class or none at all and giving a whole lot more to the underprivileged classes. Maybe God is wanting us to find some sort of proportionate universalism, meaning everybody is given something proportioned to what they need and what they righteously desire. So if that means some of us give up more, well, as the hymn would say, if we've been given much, then we too must <clears throat> give. We have to divide our gifts with every brother and sister that we see if our thanks is to be thanks indeed. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Ben. What what a great way to wrap that up. And I know that there, there's <clears throat> much to be found within this week's study that we could really get deeper into. I'm grateful for the way that you wrapped it up, <clears throat> excuse me, and summarized it. Thanks to everyone who joined us today, whether making comments or not. We appreciate you being here. John, thank you for everything that you do off to the side. Um, we wouldn't be able to do it this way you know, without you. So thank you. Next week, our lesson, it will be on Sunday, again, May 30th. You know, 9 a.m. Mountain Daylight Time-ish. We usually start between 9 and 9.20 and everywhere. Quarter after. Yeah. Uh, it, the name of the lesson is Anxiously Engaged in a Good Cause, and it covers Doctrine and Covenants sections 58 and 59, just two sections. Uh, before we sign off, I want to mention that uh, as soon as you hear our closing music, John is going to uh, post, uh, is it two videos? Two videos back to back so that you can watch um, that have to do with this. And uh, we thank you all again for joining us. Please stick around for these videos and have a great week. Steve, one of my favorite of the church's teachings is the law of consecration. Would you explain a little bit how you understand what the law of consecration is? You bet, Kate. Uh, to me, the law of consecration is a timeless law of God. It's always been. It's uh, God's way of, of teaching us to love him and love each other, but it's also very specific. Early in the Restoration, February 1831, the Lord gave Joseph Smith a revelation that says that the Latter-day Saints are commanded to remember the poor, thou shalt remember the poor, and consecrate of thy properties for their support. So the idea is to share what we have so all of us have enough. I love knowing what Edward and Lydia Partridge did in Ohio. Can you tell us a little bit about that? In some ways, they are the pioneering family of the law of consecration. The Lord called them to be among the very first families to go to Zion in Missouri and to lay the foundation, he said. So Edward Partridge went out there first. He was there for the land sales. He bought all the land he could as, as commanded with, with his money and Lydia's money that they had had and that they had consecrated to the church. And they were both willing. They both offered their all. Wow. And Lydia was right there with them the whole way. And what did it look like for other church members to consecrate their property in Ohio? They obeyed the three core doctrines of the law of consecration. They did it of their own free will, that is. They were free agents. They thought of themselves as stewards, not owners, but stewards of what the Lord had provided. And they expected to be held accountable to God uh, for what they did with his things. Lehman Copley was an early convert to the church, and he had a large farm in northern Ohio, and he expressed a willingness to let the saints who were moving in from New York settle there for a while, and then he changed his mind. That left them in the lurch, and the Lord said, I want you to go on to Missouri. So that group of saints from New York just went as a group all the way to Missouri, 
The bishop met them there and started to give them a writing, as DNC 51 says it. That is, he, he gave them a printed document, and they would write on it that they freely consecrated to the bishop of the church all their property. But one of the most interesting things about these deeds is that in every case, what Bishop Partridge consecrated back to the saints was more than what they consecrated to the church in the first place. It was not a vow of poverty. It was a way to make sure everybody had enough. Ample is one of the words in the Revelation. Everybody should be amply supplied, it says. And there is enough and to spare, the Lord says in section 104. We often say those early saints, boy, they couldn't live it. But to me, the evidence is just the opposite. They were remarkable. They were remarkable in their faithfulness, giving up a lot, making great sacrifices. I've always thought of the welfare program as being an important part of the law of consecration to people devoting their time, working on welfare farms and devoting materials, taking their goods to Deseret Industries instead of having yard sales and keeping the profits. Yes, that's a great example of how the principles of consecration are alive and well. They're still with us. So I've heard some people say that the law of tithing replaced the law of consecration in church history. That's a, that's a common saying, but it's not really very accurate. Uh, it's much more accurate to say that tithing is a part of consecration, not instead of consecration. Um, the law of consecration was given to relieve poverty and suffering. It was given, according to Section 42 of the Doctrine and Covenants, to be able to pay for the church's programs and especially to provide houses of worship, especially temples. All that is means to an end, the Revelation says, of, of the salvation of my people. So consecration is all about God saving his people and his people participating in that by helping each other. And tithing is part of that. It's not instead of consecration. The very revelation that gives us tithing says it's a standing law forever, not a temporary law that's gonna go away someday. So consecration is bigger than just tithing. Tithing's a part of it, but only a small part of it. Sometimes we, we hear, you know, when will the Lord require us to live the law of consecration? The answer to that is never. He never forced anyone to do it in the past, and he doesn't force anyone now, and he won't in the future. The question isn't, when will the Lord ask me to live it? It's, what am I going to do with it? It's on the books. It's right in front of our face. We covenant to keep the law. The question is simply, what are we going to do with it? Or what are we doing? Yeah. <laughs> Chapter 21, A Revelation to Settle in Missouri, May through June, 1831. Joseph Smith had moved from New York to Kirtland, Ohio. He asked the saints who were still living in New York to move to Ohio, and they obeyed him. Jesus told Joseph that the saints in Ohio should share their land with the saints from New York. Lehman Copley had a lot of land, and he promised to share it. Some of the saints from New York moved onto the land, but Lehman Copley didn't keep his promise. He decided he didn't want the saints from New York to have his land. He made them move, and they had nowhere else to live. Newell Knight was the leader of this group of saints. He didn't know what to do, so he went to ask Joseph Smith for help. Joseph prayed, and the Lord told him that this group of saints should go to Missouri. Before these saints left Kirtland, a conference was held. It lasted three days. The Lord gave some important revelations to Joseph Smith. The Lord told Joseph to ordain the first high priests in the church. High priests had the Melchizedek priesthood. Many leaders of the church were ordained high priests. The Lord said some of the men should go on missions to Missouri. They were to preach the gospel on the way. When the conference was over, the missionaries left for Missouri. The Lord told Joseph that the next conference of the church would be held in Missouri. He told Joseph and his friends to go there. Jesus promised to show them where to build the city of Zion. 